I'm Miwa Messer. I'm the producer and host of Port Over, and I have been so looking forward to this interview with Michael Cunningham, who I just admitted to a minute ago before we started taping, that I have been reading for quite some time, and really, a really, really, really long time, and I have read all of it, all of the novels. But Day is the new one. It's your first novel in almost 10 mm-hmm. years. Yeah. There was yelling in my office when I heard this book was coming. <laughs> <laughs> a mere 10 years. A mere 10 years, but... I mean, it's there's been a lot happening. Would you set up day, though? Because structurally, I love what you did, and it's a huge piece of the book, but I also do want to stay away from spoilers because we're airing as you have. So. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I can, I can um, deliver a brief sense of the book that will be spoiler-free. I was into a different book, maybe a third of the way done with an entirely different novel when the pandemic like Godzilla came, uh, rose up out of the river and and just destroyed everything. I couldn't find a way to work the pandemic into the novel I was writing. And it seemed, on the other hand, impossible to write a contemporary novel that did not acknowledge the pandemic. It would be like setting a novel in London during World War II and not mentioning the Blitz. But then... How do you write a novel that concerns the pandemic, but isn't about the pandemic? You know, novels are about human beings. And this needed to be a novel about human beings undergoing in their own way something that was happening to every person on the planet. So how do you do that? How do you do that? I finally settled on a structure, which is how the book ended up. It's one day in April, divided into three parts, morning, afternoon, and evening. But each of the three parts of this day takes place in a different year. Right. Morning is in 1999, before the pandemic. Afternoon is at the height of the pandemic. Evening is, I don't want to say post-pandemic because we're not post-pandemic. Right. But it is that y- the year when, when um, certainly in the lives of these characters, it's past. You know, it remains hanging in the air, but it is their lives after this catastrophe has occurred. And we follow them. Um, I sort of think of it as the pandemic, for the sake of the novel, the pandemic is a brick with a hole running through it. And the narrative is a string that goes in, in one side of the hole and comes out the other. I love this cast. And I immediately knew I was back in a Michael Cunningham novel because of how we open and where we are and who these people are. And I know when I'm reading you, there's there's sort of a gentle entry into whatever we're working on. And I'm genuinely curious always about the characters. And I followed you into some pretty trippy places. I mean, specimen days. It's yeah. like, okay, here we go. Yeah. It's you. I'm going to follow you. Yeah, uh, that's the story of an android and a, and a, and a robot lizard, a lizard right. robot from another planet who fall in love. I was really happy to meet Isabel and her husband, Dan, and her brother, Robbie. And I love the way you write siblings. It's so fascinating to me when you have two people grow up in the same family and, like, they don't actually have the same experience of the family. Like, I love that. A very primal thing for me. But a big piece of this book, Mm -hmm. marriage doesn't necessarily make people's hearts go pitter-patter in this book. (laughs) I do feel like part of what you're doing is blowing up this sort of traditional marriage plot. And there's a nod to the house of mirth and yes if you can bring edith wharton in by all means do it right so i have to confess i do need to read the mill and the floss i have not george elliott and i i was a history major in college i missed a lot of george elliott and i've now purchased a couple of different editions of Middlemarch because I keep thinking if I buy the right edition. (laughs) I didn't even do it during lockdown. I I was staring at this edition. I was like, this is the perfect time to do it. And well, you know, stuff is happening. It's not going anywhere. Um, Mill on the floss. uh, You always wonder if you're being too obvious or too subtle. 
mill on the floss is about all kinds of things, but it is fundamentally about a brother and sister who are the loves of each other's lives. So you're pulling in House of Mirth, you're pulling in Mill on the Floss, and apparently I really will follow you anywhere, because now I've gone back and reread the House of Mirth, and like I said, I really do need to read the Mill on the Floss. But watching you play with these influences and pull them in, I was reminded of the introduction that you did to Death in Venice. There's a new translation. Yeah. You did this a number of I think it was when By Nightfall came out. Yeah, it was, okay. it was a while ago. Yeah. And you're talking about how even your work, when it's not being translated into a foreign language, the act of writing is an act of translation and that you are putting images and ideas and characters into language. And I love that. And I sort of want to start there because it gives us a way to bring in all of the work and Walt and Thomas Mann. Oh, yeah. It's especially on my mind now because mm -hmm. I have been working with the first few of the translators. I, I've had long emails back and forth mm -hmm. with Dutch translators and the um, Spanish and um, just starting to talk to the Danish translators. The basic idea having worked with translators as much as I have by now is that the original, in my mm -hmm. case, book in the, in the English language in which I wrote it is already a slightly unsatisfying translation of the greater book you have had floating in a little cartoon balloon over your head for all that time. And that greater book is... I think really not a book anyone can write because it not only uses language as evocatively and piercingly as language can be used, it includes whale songs and the sounds the constellations make. And there are little scratch and sniff sections where you can just feel what the characters are feeling without it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, yeah. So I am saying to a translator, essentially, just further the translation. Just just take what's already something of a translation and rewrite it in Dutch or Spanish or Danish. You know, one of the things that I was thinking about, though, as I read Day, and I do, I love the structure. I The idea is fantastic. It's It gives these characters, and there are a couple of supporting characters, so I'm not really going to bring into this conversation, but I will laugh because the baby's name is Odin, and I'm sorry, I'm still laughing about that. <laughs> it's just a great, great <laughs> idea, and people will understand what I'm talking about when they read Day. But So the structure and this sort of three-part, very sort of clearly delineated, and yet really kind of, I need a word that isn't just Michael Cunningham-esque. <laughs> <laughs> so many words that are not Michael Cunningham-esque. Well, I did keep thinking of Mrs. Dalloway, not just because of The Hours, which is a, it's a book I absolutely love, but also because of what Wolf was trying to do when she wrote Dalloway, which was capture London in a particular moment after World War One, where the country had suffered this incredible trauma right? All of the dead young men and the horrors of war and everything else. And she's doing it in a way that, as we all know, opens with Clarissa Dalloway going to buy flowers. And the idea that there are no tiny lives, right? It's the way we talk about these lives. And, and I felt that reverberating through day. I mean, Daniel is having some career things happening and Isabel has some career things happening. And Robbie has some career things happening and there are still children who need the adults to be adults. All of these things. And yet you do cover the depth of the experience. Oh, I try to. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. F. Scott Fitzgerald said of writers of fiction, you must not love your characters too much and must not hate them at all. Right. Which has been a sort of operating principle for me and I do my best not to sentimentalize anybody but I love my students and every now and then I will get a story from a student which I can only say this strikes me as a story intended to show readers that these people aren't right worth writing a story about oh you know what I mean 
Yes, I do. Oh, yes, I do. And I would like to very much not read that story. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, you know, I, I I don't know if I would name names of particular writers, but there are right. Martin Amos, for, you know, there, yeah. there, there are, and, and rest in peace and God bless Martin Amos. But, you know, if anyone as a reader is looking for a kind of cauterizing meanness in a novel, mm-hmm. There are those novels to read. Right. And that's not what I do. You do, however, come at family sideways. And that's one of the pieces that I love. And and it is it is a through line through every single book you've written. And this idea that family is, you know, whatever we're going to make it, right? And again, like there are complications. Mm-hmm. 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 But can I also point out you had a pretty ordinary childhood? This is not. <laughs> you, yeah, I've, I've, all, I've you always had a nice life. This is not ordinary you know, childhood. But you know yeah. they can't really go back and change that. You know, we were prosperous and suburban, and I know that quote unquote unorthodox families keep turning up over and over again. And you know, of course, you don't start a novel and think I'm going to write another novel about an unorthodox family. But it's just sort of things just insist upon mm-hmm. themselves. I think for me that sort of started early as for me as a as a gay man who has so far survived the AIDS epidemic. Yeah, thank <laughs> thanks for two pandemics in one lifetime. Here's here's hoping that it stays at two. I was in the thick of it. I was involved in Act Up. Yep. And it was really apparent that as people got sick, people contracted HIV and AIDS, any number of them called their parents and said, I've got two things to tell you. Mm -hmm. I'm gay and a number of parents said, we love you, come home, we'll do whatever we need to do. But a number of parents also hung up the phone. Right. And what happened was that we collectively sort of formed alternative families. Right. Because if you're if your parents aren't taking your calls, here's your new family. We are a disco bunny, a trans woman, and you know, and 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 a leather daddy. I mean, that's a little extreme, but you know what I mean. I wanted to. I'll say honor those alternative families, but I don't. I don't, I don't mean idealize them. Right. We we fought about the same stuff. Right. It, it was not just all love and support all the time, but it was a lot of love and support. And and it was really apparent that some of us had been raised with the notion that only your family will come through for you. And guess what? Right. It turns out this is not going to be much of a revelation for anybody, but it turns out that if your family isn't there, you can make a new one. And they will, in in the case of somebody who is that sick, come to the hospital, fight with the doctors if necessary, plan the funeral, everything. Um, and that really, I think, set me on a course mm-hmm. that I might or might not have followed otherwise. But isn't that what we're supposed to do with books or isn't that what we try to do with books is have that sense of connection and have that sense of possibility and hope and change. And maybe it's not perfectly ideal, right? But so much is happening in day and yet we are so firmly in these. I feel like I know these characters. I feel like I know Isabel and Daniel and Robbie, partially because of the world I live in too, but there's a universality to them that I really appreciate and this quiet awareness and watching them figure out what's happening and the choices they're making and the choices they're not making and that empty space, right? Like, I think we miss that sometimes when we're reading and we don't necessarily give ourselves a chance to notice the silence, the decisions that don't get made. It's one of the reasons I really like reading your work because I can sit with the quiet and I can sit with the absence and it's really key yeah yes 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 um i always think of myself as writing for readers who are smarter than i am 
I'm not trying to shed wisdom or or you know moral lessons. I do think that one of the main reasons that fiction exists yeah. is that it is probably we love the movies, we love TV, and they have their own narrative powers that, that fiction doesn't have. But fiction may be the most effective way to convey to people who read it what it's like to be someone other than ourselves. Yeah. I'm always aware of the sort of obligation to do your best at doing exactly that. This is what it's like to be someone who is not you. And I feel like it makes fiction, if it's working, mm-hmm. sort of inherently political. Oh, yes. <laughs> because oh, know, yes. People, people who are empathic, who are encouraged in feeling connected to other people are, I think, less likely to think it's a good idea to bomb other countries for their mm-hmm. oil, keep children in cages, vote in certain ways, in the election to come, all that. There's this idea that reading is sort of a passive thing that you do sitting on a chair somewhere or sitting on a patch of grass or sitting on the beach. And the amount of energy, at least for me, that goes into connecting with not only the characters and what's happening, but also the author's vision. And in some cases, I'm reasonably well-versed in an author's body of work. Mm -hmm. In other cases, it's someone who's entirely new to me. And of course, my brain gets going. And for me, not just as a reader or a bookseller, I mean, the two are inseparable in my world, but it's always making the connections. Like, what have I read before? Where does this come in? I mean, you brought me back to Virginia Woolf a very long time ago. I had been one of those kids who was just like, oh, right. Yeah, of course. My mom talks about my grandma. Like, mm. And I would gotten a little snotty about it. And you come around with the hours, which I, the first time I read it, I flew through it because I could not believe how connected I was to your world and these characters that sent me back to Wolf's work. And I love having those moments of the rabbit hole, right? By nightfall, I'm going back to Death in Venice. And I've, it's happened too with Colm Tobin's novels as well, like The Master. And I love that sense of community and continuation and connection that we get from reading. And, you know, the more widely you read, like the bigger your world gets yeah 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 no i mean i slightly helplessly seem Mm -hmm. to include various literary references some some more obvious in certain books than others my brain is just full of books (laughs) and what i've read and what i've actually experienced are not entirely separate entities right this book is loosely based on death in Venice, all right? There are things like unorthodox families and literary references that are simply part of how you think and feel. And there you are. And I go back and forth on canon and how we approach canon and how canon does need to change. I mean, literature is a living, living breathing thing, right? And it should challenge us like we should be able to stretch when we read, but also, frankly, it should also represent us all a little better than perhaps it has. Yes. And also, I mean, I had people who were teaching me Steinbeck and Faulkner who clearly were not interested in teaching Steinbeck and Faulkner. And once I came to East of Eden, I was like, oh, hello. hello. <laughs> you <laughs> <with all my-> <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, a quick thing about, about who a reader is in this right. particular relationship. And yeah. Yeah, you may be reading in a hammock, or, or on the sofa, or, you know, it's, you're probably not running a marathon while mm-hmm. reading a book. But it seems really important to me to be mindful of the notion that any work of fiction is a sort of dynamic, powerful, erotic-ish, whatever relationship between a writer and a reader, even if you are, however separated you are in time and space, Mm -hmm. if the writer has been dead for 500 years, there's still a summoning. There is still a, a pact between writer and reader. And I'm always 
fascinated by by the fact that no two readers read the same book. Right. You know, everyone has different associations. What does Anna Karenina look like? Never mind this, the movies. And you know, we all have a slightly different sense of her if we've read her. Yeah. Yeah, I had issues with Madame Bovary for a really long time. And there was a new translation. I think it's Lydia Davis, actually, that made me re-examine Madame B. And I need that kind of swing in the language. When I think of coming up when I was younger, reading Balzac and Flaubert, like a lot of those translations have not changed, right? Like when I was in school, they were pretty reliably the same translations that had been out in the world. Right, right, right. You know, we love Lydia Davis for so many, for right. so many reasons that include, okay, it's my understanding that French into English is unusually difficult among okay. European languages. And Flaubert is unusually difficult even among French writers. His phraseology, right. it's just, I have a friend who is bilingual. Um, her first language was French. And I was reading a few different versions of Madame Bovary because I, I deeply love it. Um, not at first, not when I was a kid. Um, yep. it, it, would have, it would have a painting, it had an old painting on the cover. I don't know that, but um, I came around to it. And, um, you know, there is this sort of well-known line to the effect that we bang on a drum to make a bear dance when we would move the stars to pity. <laughs> and every translation, I mean, it had, of course they had it, but, but there was a slightly different version. We bang on a kettle when we would rather sing. To, you know, they're, they're different. Yeah. And I asked my friend, fluent in French and English, she said, actually, none of them is right. Oh, okay. Because she said, there's nothing in French that translates into move the stars to pity. It's just not a concept. Oh, okay. I, yeah, no, I see exactly what you're talking yeah. about. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this comes up with translators all the time. Um, well, I was thinking specifically also Chinese, actually. has There are a lot of idioms in Chinese where the English translation is challenging. <laughs> it's challenging on a, and not just on the level of of the language. So that's challenging <laughs> enough in a snow queen. Um, these two guys, two brothers, are talking about what they might still do with their lives. One of them says, "Or we could just drive out into the mad American night." which is from Kerouac, but you don't need to know, as, as an American reader, you don't need to know that that's Kerouac. You get it. It's right. an American fantasy about taking your savings out of the bank, buying a used car, and just driving out to see what else might happen. And my Finnish translator asked what that meant, and all I had to think was, you know, I bet you can't really drive out into the mad Finnish night, can you? And if you did... It would not read as a gesture of reckless optimism. You would be driving through birch forest until you fell into the ocean. There's a whole idea. Is that, yeah. particular, that particular case, this kind of American romance of the open road that aren't right. translatable. I was also laughing because I spent a summer in Finland many years ago. And I was like, yeah, that just doesn't know. <laughs> None of that works. No one's driving out in the night. night. Or if they do, it's it's for other reasons than than optimism without a second chance. Would you ever go back to the book that you'd started before day? I mean, the one that you jettisoned because it wasn't working. Is there something still there, though? Because it sounds like it was a multi-generational saga. It was. It was. And I'm I'm not sure. It is on one hand alive and well, but on the other hand, it may just have been on the shelf too long. Part of why I ask is, you know, are we in a place in the world where we are irrevocably changed? I mean, it, are there pieces of art that just simply can't come into the future with us because they don't work? Yeah. And you're obviously the only person who can decide on that front, but in that particular case with your book. But I do think, I mean, we've seen it in so many different points. And, you know, by nightfall, there is sort of this post 9-11 thread, but without ever saying, hey, all of these things happened and now we're walking around, you know, da 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 And that to me when I'm reading is really important. Like I know the context and I understand the context and I understand the timeline, 
But I also don't need it put in front of me in a five or 10 page writing on the nose kind of explanation kind of moment. And I just, yeah, I'm wondering where we go. You know, there are some writers who have said, I'm going to take this head on. And there are other writers who are like, no, thank you. I'm good. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Yeah. 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 I think we should have to wait and see where we go. Yeah, right. um, this is just related. What about the anti-Semitism in Edith Wharton and F. Scott, right? Pitts, to name a couple? What about the misogyny in almost everything written yeah. about 20 years ago? Yeah. Oh, right? it's it's wild. There's there are things I've gone back to sort of reread, and sometimes it's a good decision, and sometimes it is not such a good decision. And sometimes it's really nice to be able to say, Oh, that belongs to an 18 year old. That mm-hmm. belongs to mm-hmm. younger me, and that's great. And I don't need to go back. <laughs> like, I'm good. <laughs> yeah, I think of a book, oh, you mentioned Steinbeck. I think mm-hmm. of a book like The Grapes of Wrath as a good book to read when you're young. Yes. I, yes. Time to go to Dungeon Time. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. And then after a certain age, it's just not useful to you anymore. I it's too simplistic. It. But if you're 14, it can actually make you a better person. I mean, I wrestled with Charles Dickens, and I know there are plenty of writers who love Dickens, and yay, congratulations. And from an intellectual standpoint, I understand what he's doing and how he's doing it and why he's doing it, and I do appreciate it. But I only have so much time to read so many books and I would rather say, Hey, the mill on the floss sounds like an actual miss. I really should grab that. Whereas I don't think I need to read Martin Chuzzlewit. I think I'm good. Oh, my sister. I, I'm, I'm sure this will be infuriating to any mm-hmm. number of people, but I am not a huge Dickens fan. I'm just not, you know, No author is going to be everybody's cup of tea. Right, right. And, well, all right, I can finally come out. I (laughs) don't come out. Um, And as you say, uh, the clock is always ticking. And no matter how long we are fortunate enough to live, Mm -hmm. we won't read all the books, all the necessary books. Right. Because people keep keep writing them. And then there's there's the last couple of centuries. And so when I read something, whether it's a venerable classic or something that just came out, I have in the back of the, my mind the notion that this book is taking the place of other books. Yeah. And how do I feel about, about mm-hmm. devoting that space in my life and attention span to that book? Um, I don't know. I'm wondering how you are about this. I decided years, years ago that I didn't need to finish a book that wasn't working for me. Oh, I do not finish books. I absolutely do not. And it's not just because I'm a bookseller. It's really because if it's not for me, it will be for someone else. I have done the forced marches. I will do the forced marches. And luckily I read very quickly. Yeah. But Every opportunity I get, and when I see people sort of wringing their hands over, do I finish it? Do I not? Oh, no. Walk away. No. Oh, Quickly no. Away. To someone else, there should be no compulsion to finish a thing that is not working. But they're just, that first you know. date didn't go well. No. You have a second date. <laughs> no, you don't. You don't. <laughs> Absolutely not. And I do, and again, you know, I wasn't an English major. I have filled in some of the gaps, not all of the gaps. And I'm okay with the gaps. And there's some stuff that I have read deeply into because I went down a rabbit hole and I thought, oh, wow, you're great. I would like more of this, please. And then there are other things where I'm like, I knew I need to know this reference point. There are things where it's just like, I need to understand. I needed someone to explain that Shakespeare is best when you see it performed because it's meant to, there's a physicality to the text that, I'd sort of missed. And now I'm kind of like, oh, right. Okay. So, you know, also raised by wolves, whatever. But you come to things when you come to things, right? And that's kind of the beauty of what we do. There's the books you love and finish. There's the books you don't love and don't finish. And then I think there is, I guess, a third body of books, books that are just too important not to have read, even if you hate them. (laughs) I would say Ulysses. Can be so irritating. James Joyce just shut up, and yet it just kind of matters too much not to, you know, not to uh, get too much effect. 
There is a copy currently sitting on the floor, and it has been there for quite some time. <laughs> you know, some things they 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 find their way to a spot on the floor, and they just oh, and they, they kind yeah, of stay there. <laughs> it, seems, it seems temporary, but <laughs> but then again, you have Samuel Beckett, and Beckett is fun. Like he's weird, but he's fun. fun and short, but and fun short, and very yeah, fun. Yeah, yeah. Now, I feel like there are kind of two kinds of of venerable classics. Yeah. There's the ones that are more fun than you thought they were going to be. And uh -huh. they're less fun than you thought they were going to be. Well, humor is really subjective. And one of the things I do like when I'm reading you is you've got this very sort of subtle wit. That's mm. how I, and it's just not mean, which is nice too. And I have my, you know, books that I read when someone's tweaking another human being, but that kind of sly wit where you're kind of side-eyeing everything is really... You even give it to the kids. Violet and Nathan get to do a little bit of the... Mm. Oh, I'm yeah. Sorry. No, they, they, they have, like, their, really? have their moments by all means. And I don't mean that as in a, they sound like 40-year-olds. They sound like children, which I... Yeah. The child yeah. narrator is 40-year-old. No, please, let's not do that. Oh, um, no. I know, I know. I know. Or children are sort of generic. Yeah. <laughs> if you've ever known a child, you know how untrue that is. They notice everything. And again, this goes back to as Daniel and Robbie and Isabel are sort of figuring out their thing. The kids are noticing more than the three adults realize. Oh, sure. Oh, sure. Oh, sure. And the survival depends on it. You know, I mean, there's a little Henry James happening when we've got that going on. <laughs> oh, Henry James. Yeah. There's a nod to the man himself again. But the way you pull all of these points of view together, it's really hard to put day down. Great, great. And I did have a moment when I finished, and I was like, wait, how is that over now? Wait, I have... and I do. I read very, very quickly, but I read very differently quickly. when I'm reading the first time. And then when I'm prepping for the show, it's a, it's a very different kind of read. Yeah, 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 yeah. Unlike you, I write over, all over everything. I dog ear. I destroy uh, yeah. Gal yeah. I am notorious for destroying Gal. You're a participant in the book. Well... Yeah. Also, you don't know until you see it what the exact thing that's going to become the spine of the show is until you know it. And then yeah, yeah, you, know, you spend a lot of time. I mean, I'm looking at, I don't know, 125 pages for you, and maybe we've covered 10%, wow. which is half the fun, right? It's like that whole thing when you're writing a novel and you know exactly what's happening. Like we get the 10% as readers, and you've got this entire ecosystem <laughs> underneath <laughs> One of the things that I like about Day, there's a lot, a lot of things you don't like about a novel once you've finished it, but I realize in retrospect that given the enormity and gravity of the pandemic, there should be jokes. Why not? Because the thing is, when you go through the big horrible thing, right? You have to have a way to let off the pressure, right? You need the release valve. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, yeah I, you know, I mentioned it in part because, you know, again, you just write what you write and you do the best you can. But I have often felt with other novels that it's not like I'm some kind of barrel of laughs or anything, but they're less funny than I would like them to be. Nothing to do about that. But you know what I mean? That, that... I do see what you're saying because you do a very kind of subtle humor, but when the joke lands, oh man, it lands. <laughs> um, and and I, I, should, I should just quickly add yeah. that I think this is true of a lot of people who write. You always want to write some book other than the book you're writing. That there, there is not, and it's not only the grand book that no one can write. There's also this sense of a parallel book that you can't quite get to. And in my case, although there's nothing I can do about it, there there would there would be there would have been a few more jokes. And there's more jokes in this one. And maybe there'll be more in the next one, whatever that might oh, be. Oh, in the next one people are gonna be like tripping on banana peels and, <laughs> and yeah. But I think that's part of staying grounded though. If we can't laugh at the stuff that's hard, how do we get through? Like we shouldn't be walking around in ashes and sackcloth all the time. I, I, I just, I don't think humans are programmed to do that. Flattering. It's not a good look for anybody. And, no. and you know, it's, it's always seemed to me that 
any story that is either all tragic or all comic does not feel like an accurate representation of life on earth right because there are unspeakable losses and there's some really funny stuff some books are more comic some books are more tragic mm -hmm. but i always respond to some mix of, of the two it's the level of detail and it's those tiny tiny details that uh, violet one of the kids in this book and that yellow dress yeah. i mean you know exactly what i'm talking about and readers you'll discover it when you, when you read yellow it. Dress. yeah but it, little things like that or you know moments that robbie has there's a <laughs> robbie robbie has a instagram account for a character he made up but i thought that was a lovely touch too that i mean here we are living online in a very weird moment in our lives and sure go ahead you could be writing a novel you could have a fake instagram account whatever but these sure. tiny touches that all sort of add up to a rather epic story of us Thank you. Yeah. and what is art going to start looking like i mean certainly everyone's traveling again but what does art look like what is yeah or become like what and i don't i i don't have tons of answers i'm just fascinated and really curious to see where we go you know the only indication of where we're headed as far as i can tell and it's sort of obvious a continually expanding notion of who gets to tell a story yeah right right and that you know, if you if you if you think about what we were reading 20 or 30 years ago, who was getting published and promoted. Mm -hmm. It's really different. Yeah. It's there's there's a a lot of ground still to cover, but that's the only thing I can to see as as mm -hmm. where we're headed. That a certain story written by a certain person is one of the many and not the book, and then some other people writing other books that no one wants to publish. Michael, thank you so much. I, that seems like a really good place to wrap. And day is out now. Obviously, we've got the Mrs. Dalloway that you've written the introduction for, which is great. There's a translation of Death in Venice that you've written an introduction for, too. And of course, all of the amazing books, including At Home at the End of the World and Specimen Days and By Nightfall and The Snow Queen and Land's End. There was the travel book, too. Oh, yeah, the travel book. So there's a lot. But they start with day, don't you think? Thank you. It was such pleasure talking to you. This was great. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening. Poured Over is a Barnes & Noble production. To help other readers find us, please rate and review the show wherever you listen to podcasts.